nerds, what's up? So I did go ahead and read the 200 odd pages of the preview chapters for Winds of Winter. I don't actually think it's like 200 real pages. That's just what the PDF said that I downloaded. But anyway, here we are. I actually kind of think <laughs> this made it worse because it did feel like the start of a new book. So it was, it teased my heart a little more because then it just ends and it's like, well, that might be it, but you know, I guess I don't regret it. I'm definitely more convinced than ever though that the Selmy chapters and Tyrion chapters would have worked really, really well at the end of Dance. When I was reading those, it felt like just a continuation of where I was in Dance, whereas I personally feel like the other chapters like Ariane and Arya and whatever else felt like new chapters starting the next book. Now I know that messes with the timeline a little bit, but I feel like George could just put a little statement at the front of the book saying some of these events happen at the same time as the end of dance. Like he basically put that statement in the last few books. So I don't think it would be that weird with how the fans have come to expect kind of timeline stuff in the book. That's just my opinion about it. Okay, let's start with the Theon chapter. This was a fabulous chapter. Again, just very continuing the great momentum of the chapters at the end of dance. I do think this would be good at the beginning of winters, winds of winter just because I feel like Theon's arc felt very complete at the end of dance. In fact, I said pretty much one of the only complete ones. It was nice to see Stannis a little bit in control, like that he knew the Karstarks were betraying him. That felt good. Once again, um, feels like I have been tricked or have fallen in to being a fan of Stannis only because there's really no one else <laughs> to root for at this point. I definitely need to do some more thinking on Theon. He's such an interesting character. Um, People keep comparing him to how I changed about Jamie, but it's very, very different because with Jamie, I feel like we got an explanation for what happened and how we have maybe been told different things. With Theon, like I saw from his perspective what he was doing and it's not, I don't absolve it somehow or, or like him even as a person. I just understand his journey a little more. I'm also super curious about the timeline with Jane here. Will she miss John? Well, I mean, Okay, let me go back. Everyone's been so excited to be like, John is actually dead. Don't trust the show. Look, if someone dies and then immediately gets resurrected and doesn't act any difference, they are functionally alive. So what happens in between doesn't matter to me. Now, if you're thinking, well, he wasn't any different in the show, but maybe Martin would have him be different a la Caitlyn and Lady Stoneheart, then we can talk like if he really gets changed on resurrection. But otherwise, it's functionally the same. So either way, if John is dead, then Jane won't see him. If John gets resurrected, will Jane see him? John is the only one really nearby who's gonna know that it's not Arya. So I'm curious how long the Jane as Arya will continue. Like what is the timeline there? That's really interesting. I don't have a ton to say about the Barston Tyrion chapters, although they were very good, other than these feel like they belong at the end of dance for me. A lot of people said that apparently that was the original intention of Martin. And I would totally agree that they belong there. He could have cut out other stuff uh, and included this. I think it would have been a much better conclusion. I did really love the ending of Tyrion's chapter when the, the company is like, well, we've always been Queen's men. Like Tyrion convinces them just to pretend the whole time they've been for Danny. It was great. Next up, Arya. Whew, what a chilling chapter. One less name on Arya's prayer roll. I actually got literal chills when George changed from doing said mercy to said Arya. And I really love this push and pull of really all the Starks, but I think particularly we're seeing it with Jon and Arya of trying to leave their past behind, being told that they need to leave their family, leave their previous uh, connections behind, but just being unable to do so. John being unable to abandon his family, the Starks, and Arya similarly unable to abandon this revenge. And it, it made me think of, actually kind of like spiraled me on larger strokes of thematically uh, in the novel's loyalty and how particularly the Starks seem to garner so much loyalty from others and how that contrasts with the Lannisters who have varying degrees of success in that way. You know, Tywin, I think of all the Lannisters was one to inspire the most loyalty with Jaime, Cersei, and Tyrion being able to get different levels of loyalty for different reasons and to different effects. And also just 
Ned's legacy on his children and on everyone else and how that influences that. I don't know. I thought a lot about this for whatever reason after the Arya chapter. And I think I'm actually just going to do a whole video on it, like Ned and loyalty and that thematically in the novels. I was also thinking about it because of a comment I got on my Dance with Dragons review by Gabrielle Rodriguez. I'll flash it on the screen. It was a quote that somebody said about Song of Ice and Fire about how the legacy in A Song of Ice and Fire or a theme is that it matters what we did when we were alive, um, not when we died. And how so many characters die, but really their legacy is what they fostered when they were alive. And I really loved that quote. Thank you for that comment. And I don't know, thinking thoughts about Arya and her journey, and if we ever get wins, what that will mean as she continually has to fight this kind of conflicting pull and push and pull of leaving her past behind, but not quite burying it, just like she couldn't quite dump Needle, for example. Next up, Elaine. Um, I texted Kyle when I was done reading this chapter and was like, finally a Sansa chapter that doesn't make me want to jump off a bridge. Like Sansa got a win and it was the tiniest pinprick of a win, but I am taking it because poor girl never gets anything. I am sure if we get wins, her chapters will be 10 times more devastating to make up for the fact that this was like tiny, tiny bit of okay. I will say once again, this is a great chapter showing Sansa with her skills that some people don't want to give her and how she was, you know, raised in a certain way and that those skills can be extremely beneficial and how they come across and how she can be very intelligent and competent in these situations. So I obviously, as a Sansa defender, very much enjoyed this chapter. Okay, Ariane, not a ton for me to say here about the Dorne plot, mostly because I feel like this was very classic beginning of story, a lot of setup. Obviously what's going on with Dorne is very interesting, just I don't have a lot of commentary. I will say George makes use again of one of my favorite things in the series in this chapter, when we are hearing the narration of events that we got to witness firsthand. So they're talking about Danny and all those events that we witnessed firsthand through her eyes and what she was feeling, but now recontextualized based on what other people think those actions mean, based on the telephone game that has been played. And I just think that's so interesting how, particularly with Danny, we get to see how her story is interpreted in real time through a lot of different lenses. And I think it also is gonna be very interesting going into Fire and Blood that way, because I am guessing we are gonna get historical context for things I have heard about within the series and how history is changed by the teller. Just, I think that theme is often present, especially with Danny, and I really like that it continually gets developed. Okay, and then finally, The Forsaken. We finally get to see Aaron, Aaron again. I think this was the chapter everyone was most interested in me reading. Uh, you guys were just so excited for me to see Aaron being the worst, being really villainous. You guys just seem to really want to see me read gross stuff. So I hope you're happy now. I don't understand why there has to be a competition between Ramsay and Euron. Like, can't they both be extremely evil? I do see the vision of what you guys were saying though. Like, Euron seems more evil on a grander scale. He is harming people on a grander scale right now than Ramsay, so I get it. But I think there's, there's spots for a lot of people at the top of the evil pyramid. You can put them both there. Either way, this is obviously continuing what is set up in dance and well, starting in Clash of Kings, which is just like, everyone now is vying for the Iron Throne and how messy it has become and how far people are willing to go. I also think something that's very interesting is different views of religion in A Song of Ice Fire. I haven't really talked about that a whole lot, but we have several different characters that are very devout to several different religions and their level of response from their gods is varying as well and i just kind of wonder how that is going to develop we have melisandre who seems to get a decent amount of response or at least that is what she views it as we see theon kind of maybe considering abandoning the drowned god for the gods would because he feels recognized, although we recognize that to be Bran. We see 
uh, Aaron and the drowned god who he feels has gone silent. There's just a lot of questions about do the gods exist? How much do they exist? How much are they, which ones exist? How much are they influence or not influencing? Very, I, I would hope if we see more of the series that that gets explored more, I wouldn't expect it to be something that's answered. It doesn't really seem like something that makes sense to answer, but I do really like it as a theme. Also, man, everyone wants Danny. Poor girl. Oh, also, yeah, I noticed that the one of the warlocks was ch chanting pre, pre, which is related to the House of the Undying. And I know all y'all want me to just understand more about the House of the Undying, but you're gonna have to wait until I get there on my reread. So be patient. Okay, that was my experience reading the Winds of Winters preview chapters. Tell me if there's something I missed that you wanted me to talk about. Obviously, since a lot of it feels very beginning of book, there isn't like a ton of stuff to discuss in my opinion, but I highly enjoyed reading them. Again, kind of made me a little sadder, I think, than just finishing dance. Also, something else I want to address that I probably should have addressed in my Dance with Dragons videos, but I'll just do it here because I'm getting a lot of questions. I probably will not watch the show. I know that is gonna disappoint a lot of people. I do not think I will really enjoy the show. I know people think graphic of show and book is similar, but for me, viewing violence on screen is a lot tougher for me. You would be surprised at what regular shows I can't handle because of violence content. I really, really just do not enjoy watching that kind of thing on screen. When I'm reading, it's a lot easier to control because I'm in control of how much or how little I am visualizing in my head, as well as being able to like, skip quickly over a sentence of a nasty description. Whereas in a show, I don't really have that control in the same way. Also, this is something that I haven't really admitted on main about my personality. I just don't really need adaptations. The only reason I want my favorite authors to get adaptations is because I know it's good for their careers and I know it brings a lot of new fans and I love that aspect of it. But if I never saw an on-screen adaptation of my favorite books, I don't really feel one way or the other. It's just not something I really need. I tend to get very, very, very attached to the book form of things. And so for me, like I can just keep it the way I wanna keep it. I've also heard that they, you know, show things more graphically in some of the assault scenes than maybe I have to read in the book or draw them out or even add assault scenes that weren't previously there. All leading me to believe I just really wanna enjoy my time with the show. I know you guys are gonna be disappointed to hear that, but I, I think it's very unlikely I'll watch the show. However, I will watch a few clips. Uh, Kyle sends me clips that he knows I'll enjoy and I've seen several of them and really enjoyed them. So I probably will watch like a few things here and there. Uh, just don't expect me to watch the entire show. Okay, uh, that's it. Um, if you are not in a Song of Ice and Fire lover, I'm really sorry because I have lots more content coming up. So that will be in the next few weeks. And if you like this kind of stuff, please like and subscribe. That's the best way to support me. And if you want to see what I'm currently reading as well as other nerdy rants or updates on my journey, my reread journey, whatever, you can find me on Instagram at bookborn.reviews. I'll see you next time. Bye.